Hello and welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, hi, you're very welcome. This is Reading the Past and I'm Dr. Cat. This video, I hope, might fit quite nicely into a playlist that I think I'm going to create. I've done some other videos where I talk about the really important texts from English or British history. And I think that this video is going to fit really nicely into that. Because today, I want to talk about a history text from history. Raphael Hollinshed's The Chronicles of England, Scotland and Ireland is the book in focus today. I think it's really important that we understand this text. Not only does it give us a fantastic insight into how our early modern counterparts understood and experienced their own national history, but it's also one of the key sources for the poets and playwrights of Elizabethan and Jacobean England. Additionally, in this video, I want to show you a really fascinating resource that's been created so that you can engage with it in a surprisingly modern way. I do hope you're going to find it useful and enjoyable. Let's have a look at it. Raphael Hollinshed's Chronicles of England, Scotland and Ireland exists in two versions. The first is produced in 1577 and is a four volume text. This is then edited, amended, added to for the second version from 1587, which is six volumes. As I state at the start, I think this text is vitally important because it's a key source for the poets and playwrights of Elizabethan and Jacobean England. Among their number, is of course William Shakespeare. And if we look at this, the catalogue to the first folio, which is edited by Heming and Condell, and which I also have a video on that I'll be linking in a card up here, we can see that Heming and Condell have divided up Shakespeare's work. And underneath the histories, we have the following. The life and death of King John, the life and death of Richard II, the first part of King Henry IV, the second part of King Henry IV. The Life of King Henry V, the First Part of King Henry VI, the Second Part of King Henry VI, and the Third Part of King Henry VI, The Life and Death of Richard III, and The Life of King Henry VIII, also known as All is True, another text which I have a video on that I will be linking up here. However, Hollinshed's Chronicles, which is what I will be calling this text from now on, for brevity, if nothing else, is not only the source for the history plays. If we look at the tragedies as divided up by Heming and Condell, we see the tragedy of Macbeth, King Lear, and Cymbeline, King of Britain. Although listed as tragedies by Heming and Condell, these figures are also from Great Britain and England's history, and they also feature in Hollinshed's Chronicles. However, Shakespeare's creative force was not the only one to be influenced by Hollinshed's Chronicles, and they can claim to be the source for a variety of other authors, plays and poems. First up, we have Christopher Marlowe and his play, Edward II. Edmund Spencer uses Hollinshed for the background to the Fairy Queen. Samuel Daniel uses it for his epic poem called The Civil Wars. And it's also a feature of Michael Drayton's poems, for example, Piers Gaveston, Matilda, and the Battle of Agincourt. Through their title, the Chronicles are most explicitly tied to Raphael Hollinshed as a creator. Hollinshed, we think, is born in around 1525, is a Cambridge graduate who then dies, we think, in 1580. Considering the second version of the text is produced in 1587, this means that it's done posthumously. Calling this text Hollinshed's Chronicles is deceptive, I believe, because it hides just how collaborative a work this was. The idea for the text was not Hollinshed's. He was not the only person working on it, and come 1587, he was unable to be the one that completes it. So who else was involved? The credit for the genesis for the idea of these chronicles goes to Rainer Wolfe. He comes from the Low Countries and is a transplant to London. He decides that he is going to make a universal history or a universal chronicle, something therefore that is massive in its scope. He is dead in or before the year 1574, so before the first version of Hollinshed's Chronicles is printed. However, Wolfe had chosen as his assistant Raphael Hollinshed. It seems that after his employer's death, he refocuses attention, away from a universal history to look instead simply at the British Isles. 
It's entirely possible that Hollinshed has a number of collaborators, but two of the more prominent is one Richard Stannyhurst and William Harrison. And these two men are particularly interesting because they work on the same text, but clearly are quite divergent in religious sympathies. And in the 15s, 17s and 80s, this divergence would normally put people at odds. You would not necessarily expect two people who believed so categorically differently to be working on a text together. But Richard Stanihurst was a noted friend of the Jesuit martyr Edmund Campion. Indeed, Campion's text on the history of Ireland was reworked for use as the history of Ireland in the Chronicle. Indeed, Stanihurst himself would go on to be a prominent Catholic refugee. Meanwhile, his colleague, who was assisting in the creation of the Chronicle, William Harrison, was a clergyman, tied to the lines of radical reform within the Church of England. Harrison is known to be a devout, radical Protestant. Similarly, when revising the text for the 1587 publication, the religious differences of the team of collaborators is also evident. Overseeing this revision is one Abraham Fleming, a devout Protestant who would go on to become a clergyman. To assist him, he had, among others, one John Hooker, known to be a devout evangelical Protestant. He is tasked with working on the Irish section of the Chronicles. And many people say that you can see in his version of the text a profoundly anti-Catholic bent in his history of Ireland. His colleague was John Stowe, who many people allege to have been a crypto-Catholic. As I mentioned earlier, the fact that clearly these religious differences are at play, and yet this work is being created, is really interesting. The fact that these divergent and frequently discordant groups could come together and collaborate as effectively as they do is really fascinating to me. And I'm not the only one who thinks so. In fact, I think the reason why I find this so fascinating is best explained by the group that created that resource I was talking about at the start of the video. So now I want to take you over to their website to show you what they say about it and also to show you the resource itself in action. Let's go. This is the homepage for the resource that I was talking about. It's called the Hollingshead Project. And as I said, I want to look at a quote. Halfway down the first paragraph on this homepage, the quote begins, Among the authors and revisers were moderate Protestants, Raphael Hollingshead, John Hooker, militant Protestants, William Harrison, Abraham Fleming, crypto-Catholics, John Stowe, and Catholics, Richard Stanihurst, Edmund Campion. The upshot was a remarkably multivocal view of British history, not only because of the contrasting choices of style and source material, but also because the contributors responded very differently to the politics and religion of their own age. And as I said, this puts it better than I ever could. Through Hollingshead's Chronicles, you are not getting a homogenised view of history. We are seeing how a variety of early modern people who sit across the religious spectrum are responding to the history of their own nation. And for me, that is what makes it particularly fascinating. From this website, you can get access to that resource I mentioned. So if you go into the menu and go to texts, it comes up with a link where you can go to the parallel texts, 1577 and 1587. So if we go to that, it's going to take you out to another website. Again, I will be leaving the link to this website that's on display here in the description bar down below. But when we get to that, as you can see here, both on the main page and also in the menu, you have got both editions, the one from 1577 and from 1587. And you can search them through both list of chapters and list of regnal years. So I'll just show you in 1577, the list of chapters comes up, volume one, two, three, and four, as I mentioned, and then you can click on each bit as you might want to see it. And that's how it's arranged by title, by subject matter, by king. If, however, you want to just look at the monarchs that you might be more familiar with, you might want to go through list of regnal years. So that starts with William the Conqueror in 1066, unsurprisingly, and goes all the way through, so we go down, 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 to Elizabeth I. As mentioned, this is the 1577 edition, so it stops with 1576, unsurprisingly. The list of chapters, however, will take you earlier in the historical narrative. So we have the description of Britain or the ancient names of this island 
what sundry nations have inhabited this island. It's much the same setup in the 1587 edition. Once again, we have a list of chapters. As I stated, it's volumes one to six. And this one seems to start even earlier. We have here the division of the whole earth. So a very early start to the historical narrative. If, however, you want to go to list of regnal years, once again, we start with William the Conqueror and 1066. But in this case, as it is the later edition, we do go all the way through to Elizabeth I, 1587. As an example of what you might see when you look at this website, let's take something that's a very well-known event. How about the execution of Anne Boleyn? Now, we know this occurs in the reign of Henry VIII. The regnal year is 28, and that is 1536 to 1537. So let's see what Hollinshed's Chronicle says about that very, very famous event. It starts, as many accounts do, that her fall begins with the May Day joust, that the king leaves suddenly and takes with him Henry Norris. Then we hear about a series of arrests. We hear about her brother being arrested and being taken to the tower. Moving down to the second paragraph on this page, we see the following quote. Immediately, the Lord Rochford, the Queen's brother, was likewise arraigned and condemned. The Lord Mayor of London, his brethren the Aldermen, the Wardens, and four persons more of every the twelve principal companies being present. The 17th of May, the Lord Rochford, brother to the Queen, Henry Norris, Mark Smeaton, William Brereton, and Francis Weston, all of the King's privy chambers, about matters touching the Queen, were beheaded on the Tower Hill. The Lord Rochford's body with the head was buried in the chapel of the tower, the other four in the churchyard there. On the 19th of May, Queen Anne was on a scaffold made for that purpose, upon the green within the Tower of London, beheaded with the sword of Calais by the hands of the hangman of that town. Her body with the head was buried in the choir of the chapel at the tower. We are also given an account of Anne Boleyn's scaffold speech before her death, which you can see here. We can then click through to the next page. The author of this section is not averse to voicing what he thinks of Anne Boleyn. He calls her this noble queen and, quote, refers the reader unto Master Fox, his volume of Acts and Monuments, that's the Book of Martyrs, where he commendeth her mild nature in taking admonition, proveth her marriage lawful, defendeth her succession, overthroweth the sinister judgments, opinions and objections of backbiters against that virtuous queen. For this author, clearly, Anne Boleyn was innocent of all charges, a virtuous noble queen wrongly done to death by backbiters, a true martyr, as befits the characters in Fox's Acts and Monuments. It is accepted that Hollinshed's Chronicles acted as a vital source for the plays and poems of Elizabethan and Jacobean England. This is especially true in the case of William Shakespeare. I made a video that I'm going to link in a card on Henry VIII or All is True, the play by William Shakespeare. In that video, I express my surprise that William Shakespeare seems to curtail the narrative somewhat, ending his play with the christening of Elizabeth. Although perhaps looking at this portion of Hollinshed's text, we can understand why. Is Shakespeare being influenced by the historical narratives that are being presented to him? To see Anne as an innocent martyr to the Protestant cause? Is this one of the reasons that he chooses to stop his play first staged in 1613, at the point that he does. I would love to know what you think about that question. I hope this video piqued your interest and whetted your appetite sufficiently that you went and checked out this resource for yourself. If you did, I'd love to know what you think of it. Did you find things you weren't expecting or was everything as you thought it would be? Let me know in the comment section down below or come and find me over on my social media. I'll be leaving links to those in the description box. Follow me there and we can continue this conversation. The comment section and my social media is also a place you can come if you've got any ideas for a video you'd like me to make, whether on another historical text or any other topic. So please do let me know. I really hope you've enjoyed this video and found it useful. If you did, then let me know by hitting the thumbs up. Please also subscribe to this channel and click the bell icon so that you'll be notified by YouTube when I next upload. I hope you're going to have a great day, whatever you're doing, and I look forward to speaking to you in my next video. Take care of yourselves. Bye-bye for now.